Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Smart Human Podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of talking with Dr. Yvonne Burkhardt, who is a PhD toxicologist with 23 years of toxicology experience studying fragrance chemicals, food chemicals, and so much more. Today, we talked about common cosmetics chemicals, how they affect human health, how to choose safer products, cosmetic legislation changes, and so much more. So stay tuned. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Smart Human Podcast. Today, I have the pleasure of talking with Dr. Yvonne Burkhardt, who is a PhD toxicologist who received her PhD in environmental toxicology from the University of California, Irvine, and completed her postdoc research fellowship at the University of California, San Diego, where she studied ovarian theca cells in relation to polycystic ovarian syndrome. Dr. Burkhardt also served as a senior senior toxicologist and consultant in the flavor and fragrance chemical industry, where she was instrumental in establishing in vitro models of toxicity to assess the risks of these chemicals in food and consumer products. She is a 23-year veteran of toxicology with expertise in reproductive toxicity, particularly endocrine disruption, infertility, cancer, and glutathione homeostasis. And after experiencing the power of a low-life, low-tox lifestyle with her own family, Dr. Yvonne Burkhart began a mission to help consumers and parents slash their own toxic exposures. Dr. Burkhart, thank you so much for taking the time for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So I want to jump in because I have been watching your work on social media and you do so much um, in um, kind of sharing with people the, you know, personal care products, cleaning products, a lot of products, but I really wanted to pick your brain on personal care because, um, you know, I think it's missing. I think too many people are on TikTok and social media buying junk and scary junk. Um, So I guess I'll start by asking, you know, what what are your thoughts about the industry now as compared to, say, where it was maybe a couple decades ago? I mean, we have this explosion here of chemicals and products, but just give me your thoughts sort of like why you felt so compelled to jump into the market as an educator in this area. I really agree with you exactly what you said. There is a missing link. And I think it's an often overlooked source of toxic exposure. And most people accept what is being sold to us on store shelves as being safe as is when there is not enough data behind most of the ingredients out there. And they have not been well studied or well characterized. And now we're seeing the health effects. So what prompted me to get started in this space was my own fertility challenges, that I was having hormonal issues and a lot of fertility issues that doctors couldn't explain. And I wanted to give my body the best chance that I possibly could at a, I would say, an unassisted conception. I wanted to just see what I could do because they told me the only option you have is IVF and I wasn't willing to accept that. So I went down my own route of studying and testing things on myself, such as removing different products, swapping things out on my own. And I really found such incredible power in scrutinizing ingredient labels. That's really what prompted this all because even as a toxicologist, as someone who understands chemical names and chemical safety and toxicity, it was still challenging, extremely challenging for me to make sense of what I was buying. Yeah, that's that's great. I mean, when it when it's personal, you're so much more invested in this in the struggle, you know? And I think that that's what's so interesting and makes you more even, you know, passionate about what you do. And you know, as a toxicologist, it's really interesting because you know, you're seeing things in lab a lot, but seeing it in humans, maybe making that leap to you personally um, is kind of interesting. And tell me a little bit about, you know, um, why did you think that there was this connection between these chemicals and fertility for you? I mean, in other words, not just what you were learning, but, um, you know, what were some of the movements towards the endocrine disruption research that it prompted you, um, you know, into, into looking deeper? When I was in the toxicology lab as a student over 20 years ago, there was the endocrine disruption was somewhat in its infancy and people were starting to talk about it. I was attending the endocrine society meetings and it just was part of the work that I found myself in as a student. And just by proxy, I think I had that thought in the back of my mind ever since I first learned about it. And I didn't think it applied to me. I really didn't. Even though I had hormonal issues 
throughout my entire, I would say, young adult and adult life. I just did not connect the dots. And it wasn't until I had those fertility issues that I said, okay, well, I think I might be struggling with hormone disruption, with endocrine disruption. I've got to figure this out. I have to explore every avenue, leave no stone unturned, because it was at that point where it was either I have no kids or I have kids. And it was really a lifelong dream. I've always wanted to be a mom. So I was not willing to accept no for an answer at that point. I was just absolutely determined. So with my training, it actually made it more challenging for me to explore what I was doing in my life. Because as a toxicologist, we're trained to look at chemicals, really toxic chemicals, carcinogens and um, oxidizers, very harsh chemicals in the lab. Things that that we know to cause cancer, but not low doses, not consumer product ingredients. None of those are mentioned at all. In fact, in the toxicology textbook, there might be a paragraph in there about cosmetics, a paragraph out of hundreds of pages. So there was a huge gap missing for me. And I said, there's got to be a connection there because I know for a fact that some of these chemicals are triggering my symptoms. I can just feel it. Because once I started working in the flavor industry, I'm exposed to these chemicals just on the job. Mm. And I noticed my symptoms get worse. And I thought, oh, is it just the stress of the job? I don't think so. This can't be the only thing. Yeah, you had you had like that that aha moment, like I have been robbed in my education of something and I don't know what it is because toxicologists by definition, isn't there a clash between a lot of sort of the endocrine disrupting chemical researchers and sort of the toxicology paradigm of the dose makes the poison. Tell us how some of these chemicals work that are sort of stealth under the radar. They don't have high doses, but they sort of seep into our bodies and our lives over time and how that affected perhaps perfect, you know, affected your fertility. And you'll tell us more about that. Yeah. I love that you asked the question in this way because you're exactly right. The very first page of the toxicology textbook has the quote by Paracelsus, the dose makes the poison. That's just drilled into our minds. And that's something I couldn't let go of was there's no way if I use more of these products, shouldn't I have more, uh, more symptoms? Well, that's not necessarily the case because with endocrine disruptors, there is what's known as monotonic dose responses, where the lower the dose, the more prominent or pronounced the response, the higher the dose, less of a response. So it's backwards. It basically challenged everything that I learned and turned it upside down on its head. And you're right, there is a clashing because even colleagues of mine in toxicology were even lab mates. We studied endocrine disruption together, still had a hard time making the connection and challenging what we had learned from the beginning. So it's, it was really uh, an existential crisis almost because I, how could what I have learned to be true, I got my entire degree on this, how could it be wrong? I could not believe it, even though I had already been in, in the endocrine disruption world for years already at that point. It was just such a challenge. And even in the lab when I was doing experiments, I observed monotonic dose responses in my experiment. So it, it, it's real. <laughs> Right. So that's fascinating because when I hear like you have a toxicology degree, I was like, ooh, like is she in trouble with her people that she trained with? And is, ooh, is she like stepping out? Because every, you know, sort of that world of toxicology, like like you said, is built on that premise that that the more of an exposure, the more likely you're going to experience those physical symptoms or changes in levels. But what you're, you discovered and what I had to find out the hard way too, because I didn't learn this in medical school, was that low levels, like parts per million, parts per trillion, like one drop of water in like 20 swimming pools is able to do harm in some chem- with some chemicals. Right. I mean, that's essentially what we're seeing is how they work with hormones. Hormones work like that. Right. We're talking picomolar, teeny tiny amounts that are able to trigger all of these different pathways and stimulate different signaling pathways that just become out of control. So with endocrine disruption, it's not just that they're disrupting hormones, but they're also disrupting cellular regulation, like cellular, um, excuse me, cell cycle regulation. So there can be triggering of these cell pathways that can lead to cancer. 
Okay, right. And so also, so there's other offshoots of the endocrine disruption studies. I mean, essentially, like I'm now deep into the immune effects, which no one really has a big handle on. And we all talk about endocrine, but now we cancer we've seen and now even immune and even metabolic. We have metabolic changes that, that go on. So anyway, so that's a lot to take in. And so tell me what you started with. I mean, you had this epiphany, you decided to sort of go your own way. You were passionate and maybe desperate if you wanted to call it that. You were really, you know, what What were the things that you changed? What were the first steps that you made that you maybe thought were the right moves and saw a benefit from? Yeah, it was actually, if you want to say rock bottom. I, it was really a rock bottom, uh, you know, ice cream on the floor, just crying and just had to just figure something out. I had to do something because it was just so bad at that point that my symptoms were uh, things that included like uh, brain fog. I had extreme fatigue, no matter how much I slept, dark circles, acne. I mean, these were totally abnormal for someone in my 30s, right? So I'm like, okay, I have to do something about it now. I started doing my own research online and I found integrative and functional medicine, which is where I started because I said, okay, as a scientific person, I, I need someone to help me guide through, guide me through yeah. this. So I found someone who would do tests they ran a bunch of different lab tests. They were looking at all my levels, my hormones, and things like that. And they said, oh, it looks like what we need to do first is actually address your gut permeability. So I was having leaky gut. And I thought, what's leaky gut? I've never heard of that in my life. But I was reacting to quite a few foods at the time. Mm -hmm. So we started first with a diet to heal the gut and remove the triggers. So that's where I started. And I saw a significant improvement there. But that wasn't the end of it because one thing that I noticed was that my practitioner mentioned nothing about consumer products, environmental toxins, not even water quality, nothing. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. Let me do some more research on my own. So then I started, you know, swapping out products on my own. First started with my makeup because I was a huge makeup lover at mm -hmm. the time. And that was definitely one of the more challenging areas because Products have come a long way since then. That was over 10 years ago. But back then, it was challenging to say the least. I started with my makeup. Then I switched to my personal care. And of course, I got an air purifier. I got a water filter. I started eating more organic foods, preparing my own foods at home. So basically, an entire lifestyle overhaul. And it happened within the span of, I'd probably say, six to nine months. And then I was able to get my period back. Interesting. So that was it, that you were basically amenorrheic, not having periods, and so not able to basically fertilize an egg, you know, essentially, or, or produce yep. an egg. And, and, and then you you really did see the benefit because, well, now you have two kids, right? So that's, that's kind right. of the punchline, right? But but you actually, um, were you a good eater before? Were you generally thought you were doing things well with like, you know, generally good diet? I thought I was doing well, but apparently not. So yeah. I was uh, eating conventional foods. I wasn't thinking about eating organic. I was preparing foods quite often for myself, but probably not with the best quality mm. of, of, let's say, meats or vegetables. I wasn't necessarily uh, really in tune with my body at that point either. If I was noticing any reactions to foods or things like that, I wasn't paying attention to that at all. It was you know, just eat whatever I have been eating my entire life and don't really question it because why would I? Because that's what you learned. Right. So tell me a couple chemicals that are pretty common. Like let's let's ease into this with this audience. Like what, what are some of the more common chemicals that you want to talk about that are in products we would know and maybe even know and love and why they may be problematic? Yeah, I'd probably say the one that everyone knows is fragrance. This is a loophole. It's an umbrella term that is actually legally allowed to let companies protect their proprietary formulations. And it's a very antiquated, old concept that was grandfathered in by the FDA, ooh, I'd say over 100 years ago, where these flavor and fragrance houses just protect their proprietary formulation because they don't want their competitors to steal their formulas. So they are able to hide any combination at least for fragrances, nearly 4,000 different chemicals that are on the International Fragrance Association website. It's the called the IFRA Transparency List. So that's the industry website 
They tell you what could possibly be in your fragrances. And to be honest, I was really shocked when I saw styrene and really toxic carcinogens in there. And I thought, these are inhalation toxicants. Why are they in products that are designed to be inhaled? How is this possible? How is this legal? Wow. I didn't realize that they had, they still have some of those. I mean, styrene, people think of styrofoam and they're like, oh, well, I just get my takeout in styrofoam, but styrene is actually the precursor chemical. It's known to be carcinogenic, but you're saying now it's put into fragrance where when we think we breathe it in and it doesn't cause any harm, you know, it depends on how much you breathe. It depends on how often you breathe it, you know, right. your environment. I mean, everyone and how big of a person you are. What if you're a child that's always around these fragrances, you know, versus an adult? How would that change? How does it, how does it matter in terms of even just a, a big person, little person, male, female, or even a child, a pregnant woman? What? How would that be more of a risk or a reason to swap those out? Well, the the biggest risk would be for the developing fetus, definitely. Because the these some of these chemicals can cross the placenta and enter into the fetal circulation. So we can't say that, you know, oh, the placenta is filtering things out. A lot of these can cross. Not only that, the fetus does not have detoxification pathways built in. They're not active yet. Even up until the age of about 10 years old, children cannot detoxify. Their systems are not mature yet. So these early life exposures, these critical windows of susceptibility are already there. And so a lot of families, unfortunately, don't know about this, mine included. I grew up, you know, with the mainstream name brand products with all the fragrances. It's just what was there. And so no one questioned it. We just used it. And unfortunately, these are still harboring a lot of harmful chemicals. Yeah, no, it's it's really interesting. As I'm listening to you, I feel like you and I live parallel lives. Like all of the junk food I grew up with that was processed, like it was like the greatest thing ever to have all this processed food come into our house. But years later, now we're learning about the science, you know, and it's, it's a little scary. Um, so when you have a pregnant woman and she's got this sort of unprotected fetus, so really it makes you think that, you know, you want to be clean in your body as best you can before you even get pregnant, right? Yes, that's this is true because it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one where the mother's toxic burden is transferred to the fetus, but the mother's blood levels of various toxic chemicals like PFAS, phthalates, these are correlated with higher risks of adverse pregnancy outcomes, miscarriage, developmental delays in the child. There's a whole laundry list of effects that have been seen with epidemiological studies. Yeah. And that's just, and then, so that's the fetus and then, um, and phthalates that are related to a whole bunch of other like genitalia changes in males and that kind of thing that was, you know, so you have the physical stuff, but then we have the brain stuff that we don't even know is going to develop until the kid starts to develop. Right. You know, right. it grows. So, and what would we say would be worrisome, like sort of in the teenage years? Because don't they use a lot of products? Like what, what, what are these windows that you think are particularly worrisome? Yeah. So the first one is in utero mm -hmm. and then of course, neonatal, but then also within the toddler years, because the toddlers are usually crawling on the ground. And so a lot of these chemicals, unfortunately, bind to house dust and dust settles on the ground on different surfaces. The baby's crawling, inhaling them, and also mouthing behavior is making them more susceptible as well. Then you get a little bit older, I'd probably say around mm, early adolescent is when we start to see another window of risk, susceptibility, because there's actually... A study that came out that I was even shocked by. So it's one thing to have these chemicals around you. That's a, a risk, right? It's a risk. But we don't know if that will actually result in some disease. There was a study that was published fairly recently showing that young girls that used personal care products, the more products they use, the higher incidence of breast cancer. So there's actually now disease correlated with it. It's not just this theoretical, oh, well, it's there. It could be harming you. No, it is harming. It is harming us. Right. No, that that study and you sent it to me and, and we I mean, it's just remarkable. And, and um, you know, basically they followed these women out 
I think, 10 years out, more or less. And then they looked at Hispanic, Black, and white women, and they showed that they all had basically increased risk, um, essentially, from using, I think, a single product. Or, um, But we know that mixtures of chemicals. I mean, let's just say, how many products do most people, my teenagers, everyone use, women, in a daily basis? So, you know, you don't always have just the individual risk of one chemical, if you could identify it but the mixtures of multiple over time, right? How does mixtures yeah. play? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, they could be synergistic. They could be additive. No one really knows because they're not characterized. No one yeah. studies these things. And then it's, uh, oh, well, let's, you know, hope that nothing happens. And then, well, now we're connecting the dots and, you know, having to work our way backwards because chemicals are treated innocent until proven guilty, which is completely backwards. In Europe, they have more of a, guilty until proven innocent framework. It's not bulletproof, but it's significantly better than what we have in the U.S. Yeah. I wanted to just take a minute to talk about products that are directed to certain demographics that are marketed to ter- certain demographics, like African-American females or young girls um, of color. Um, I wanted to know what your thoughts are and what you know about in terms of those formulations and how they may be implicated in some higher risks, even even for adult African-American women in terms of maybe hair straighteners or, um, you know, other products? Yeah, there are chemicals of concern in beauty and personal care products that are marketed toward certain demographics. There's even studies on this. There is an unfortunate incidence known as environmental injustice. And what I've seen when I go into stores and I look at products that are marketed for more ethnic hair types are some of the worst chemicals that should not be allowed in beauty and personal care products. And it makes me sick when I see products that are marketed for African-American girls, young girls with, you know, the colors and all the things for marketed towards children that have some extremely harsh chemicals in them. There are formaldehyde in a lot of these hair straighteners. There's an increased incidence of uterine cancer and various cancers in African-American females. And, it's something that should not be allowed. And I think there needs to be more justice and more regulations on this. And I think there are some brands that are more uh, intended to be cleaner for these markets. Are they the absolute cleanest? Not yet, but it is a step in the right direction. And I'm glad that they're available and I've seen them at mass retailers, which is good. It's just informing the public of which ones are the better options. And I think this is something that's also missing as well. And something that, you know, I think I myself can also address. Yeah. And then there's, you know, I actually was thinking about this when I talked to a bunch of students and there was a couple of girls that were in the class that were African-American and I brought in products that according to EWG skin deep database and some of these other helpful apps like Clearia and Yuka, um, it's helpful. It's not perfect, but it's helpful. And there was a real appreciation for sussing out those particular products that would be helpful to that particular demographic. And I think that that's moving in the right direction, as you said. Um, but it also may explain why in young girls, um, as a subset, even African-American young women, there's an earlier onset of breast development and onset of periods and sort of this early, you know, speak to that if you can. Yeah, the part of the endocrine disruption is is the shifting of the puberty age to much earlier. Seven, eight-year-old girls are getting breast development, pubic hair development, as well as their cycle is starting. And this is totally abnormal. And this leads later on to premature menopause later in life. So that's the that's the the other end of the spectrum is you get this entire window of your reproductive life is shifted earlier. So it's devastated on both ends, right? When you start too young and when you end too young. Yeah, we we kind of are a free for all for manufacturing in this country, which which always makes me think like, what is exactly a legitimate regulation? Like you said, organic. I always think to myself, that's probably the only thing that has teeth in this country where there's actually a standard, you know? Right, yeah, I agree with you. you. Why do you choose organic? Tell me a little bit about like your thoughts on that. I choose organic mainly because I am looking to reduce my exposure to low levels of pesticides in foods, right? That's the main avenue for pesticide exposure is through food. And also because of occupational exposures and environmental impact 
So if I'm buying, a lot of people think, oh, well, I'm eating, I don't eat the peel, for example. I eat bananas, but I don't eat the peel. So I'm, I don't need to buy organic. Technically, mm-hmm. you don't. But I consider the entire lifeline of that product, for example, the farmers, what's going into the soil, what's going into the water, because it all we're all connected. It's the same. We're part of the same ecosystem. So I'm, I'm mindful in that choosing organic and even more optimal is, I guess, regenerative, looking to recover soil biodiversity and mineral nutrient content, things like that. I'm mindful of that. So if I can do it, I will. To the best of my ability, just because I personally experienced occupational toxicity, I've witnessed countless people on the job also experience that, as well as my own mom. So this is something that is very personal to me. So it's it's important to me that as a consumer, if I can do my part to prevent, help prevent occupational toxicity and exposures, then I'll do my part. It's great that you mentioned that not a lot of people even think about the OSHA, the OSHA regulations, the occupational safety regulations set up by the gov- by our U.S. government were, were designed to protect, you know, workers that are involved in a lot of different, you know, kind of toxic exposure occupations. But they're also allowing higher levels of exposure than the average consumer. So you're absolutely right. There's a value to that, but there's not really. Like you start to think like, yeah, they can get workers to work in horrible situations sometimes, but they're also exposed to such higher levels of of many of the chemicals that we take for granted or have more of a choice over, you know? Yeah, exactly. And it's really unfortunate that most of the human data we have on chemicals comes from occupational exposures. Right. And migrant me, farm that, workers. Right. And- And to me, I think that is just so morally wrong that I don't want anyone to be exposed to this because I think, what was my mom being exposed to? What was I being exposed to? And all of my coworkers. And, you know, we had to do biometric um, monitoring. Mm -hmm. We had to get monitoring every year because they didn't want, God forbid, someone to get sick and be able to blame it on, on what they were exposed to at work. Interesting. Wow. Can I ask what your mom, what her life and her experience was with the chemicals, or do you want me to? Um, yeah, you can ask. Okay. So tell me a little bit about what your mom ex- mom's experience, speaking of occupational, and you mentioned it, wh- what was her experience? Yeah, she was working in a uh, machinist job, so in manufacturing for electronic parts. Mm-hmm. And so there were a lot of different solvents and different chemicals and things, and she wasn't adequately protected. She would tell me sometimes that she would dunk her arms into this t- vat without any gloves or anything, any protection. And I thought, mom, what, what is that? And she couldn't tell me, you know? And so uh, you, she, she isn't in tip top health right now. And I'm convinced that it was the result of these occupational exposures. Yeah, that's a terrible story. I hope she does, you know, I hope she does better. I, it's just, I hear so much of it. And then, you know, I see it as for patients. And then, of course, I'll be like running or walking and I'll see someone spraying, you know, like what, what looks to be like Roundup or, you know, without any protection or doing like, you know, I saw a guy doing the, uh, uh, you know, breaking up cement with no mask, you know, and I thought of all the cement and all the, you know, potential silicosis and, you know, exposure. I think people just don't think of things in terms of short-term exposures of having harm, right? Right. Which is actually interesting because there's acute exposures and then there's chronic exposures, right? So like acute exposures, people don't think, oh, it's going to cause any issues until, like you said, you're inhaling a bunch of concrete or metals or whatever is in that mixture. And you just are like, oh, well, now I feel funny a little bit later. And sometimes people don't connect the dots back to what actually triggered that response. Yeah, or exposures from train derailments like East Palestine or, you know, these horrible, you know, you hear about these stories where there's a, uh, you know, um, a train derailment and and liquid or volatile gases or what have you. And, you know, it's hard to connect the dots. And then there's not a lot of, um, you know, um, exposure, you know, evaluation and following these folks out for years unless people really jump to it. So, um, yeah, it's not, it's, it's a very difficult situation to kind of connect cause and effect. There is no real cause and effect. It's association in many of these cases because there's so many confounders with humans. We have so many different aspects of exposure. So they become particular. That's why lab studies and the work you've done, you can actually isolate with mice or with rats or, you know, um, that makes it a little bit easier to control some of the factors that create disease, right? 
Right. But then at the same time, it is a rodent model. It's not a human. Right. So it's it's really challenging to make that correlation. And even when I was doing uh, some cell work, I was using human cells and they were primary human cells, which is great instead of, you know, immortalized cancer cell lines. But still there's, you know, different changes and stuff molecularly that are happening when you manipulate the cells outside of the body. So you can't always correlate it one-to-one. Although, you know, you do your best, but... right. No, I, I hear you. There's no great model, but, you know, putting all the evidence together is where you make these precautionary principles, you know, thoughts like, well, you know, if you have enough data in animal studies and epidemiologic studies in populations or migrant farmers or, you know, other occupations, you can put together kind of a, a thought that it might not be good for you. Right. Yeah, to- that's exactly right. And and that's interesting because that's most of what I work with online whenever I'm sharing this type of data is I'm just using my scientist brain. I'm reading all the research and I'm just connecting the dots because there, there is such a, a gap in knowledge. And so there isn't data. There's nothing that we can really back it up with mechanistically. So we're right. just doing the best that we can to piece it all together. And I had these, you know, hunches and inklings and hypotheses years ago about all these personal care products and chemicals and it was, I was met with a lot of resistance, but, you know, over time, I think people are unfortunately noticing the effects themselves. Yeah. No, I think it's, it's fascinating. And, um, you know, look, fierce people, fierce people that are affected personally, that are, that find their power. We need people like that, like you, you know what I mean? It's important. Um, tell me some more chemicals. We talked to you, you know, you mentioned the first, you know, um, you know, the area. Tell, give me some more ideas, more chemical groups besides like sort of fragrances. Do you, any specifics you want to share in terms of where they we find these chemicals? Yeah, another one that has been somewhat controversial, which shouldn't be controversial, are parabens. Mm-hmm. Parabens are, you know, they're considered quote unquote weak estrogens, but they're still estrogenic. So even if it's weak or strong, I think that word, we should throw that out. Just ignore that. If it's activating the estrogen pathways, we need to pay attention to this because this is this is not normal. <laughs> and it's not anything beneficial that we need externally. We have our own estrogen. We don't need more. So I think parabens being controversial is, is uh, I think it's moving out of the way. I, I guess we can just say with certainty, parabens are not safe. Parabens are toxic. And there's lots of them. Like, just yes. like there are PFAS chemicals, there are lots of them. And BPA has a lot of um, substitution. Analogs. Yes. yes, analog. Thank you for that yes. word. Um, tell me about that. So what does the chemical industry do when something is actually not so much removed, which we'd love, which is not done, but sort of um, moved away from the public you know, eye in terms of taking it out of products because of popularity problems? Yeah, right. So consumers make demands and information spreads online and then they start, hey, we got to start swapping them out. We got to use a different chemical with the same functionality because we need the product to still work the same way. Otherwise, we're going out of business. And then they'll swap it out with something that is similar in toxicity, but that the consumers are not aware of yet. And this is known as regrettable substitution. And it, it happens all the time. And it's really unfortunate. For example, the PFAS, all of the cookware, PFOA, PFOS free, but then they substitute with other similar chemicals like Gen X that mm-hmm. people just don't know what Gen X is, but it's almost identical. So <laughs> it just, yeah, it, it's basically just trying to lie to the market, but keep the same functionality. Because as you know, as a toxicologist in the product industry and product design, it's not easy to recreate the same function unless you find the chemical that does the same job, whether it's heat resistance, whether it's stain resistance, whether you, you tell me, I mean, these, these formulations take millions of dollars to come up with. And so then when they have to take something out, it becomes a kind of a nightmare for the manufacturers or at least right. they claim. Right. That's exactly right. They, they can't switch something out completely to a different chemical because it won't behave the same way. Chemicals behave the same way because they are structurally related to one another. So a great example, and this comes up all the time in skincare, is retinols versus bacuchiol. So people say, oh, bacuchiol is this um, plant-based, plant-derived retinol alternative. But guess what? It activates the same signaling pathways. Mm. So how is it different? Maybe it's not as potent. Maybe you need to use more of it to get the same effect as a synthetic retinol, but it still activates the same pathway. So how is it different? Because it comes from a plant, it's better. That's the perception. Yeah. 
Cocaine comes from a plant too, doesn't it? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's lots of examples, you know, but, um, but being plant-based doesn't always make it better. And by the way, by the, I've tried plant-based stuff that's made me reactive. So it's not even not natural safe things can always react to your body because everyone's so individual. That's something else I noticed also that, that you know, every human so different in your reaction, your genetics, your response, but then you add this chemical burden in and then it can actually be really heightened. Um, okay, more chemicals. I love learning this stuff. Keep going. Okay, quaternary ammonium compounds. This is somewhat something that maybe people have not heard about, but they're also known as quats. Mm -hmm. And I first heard about them years ago when I was still doing research. There is a small group of people that does reproductive toxicology. So we see them over and over at this, at conferences, and we always you know, just kind of share our research with each other. And one of the professors had moved her lab from one university to another and then noticed that all of a sudden her mice became infertile. And she said, what happened? Is it the shock from moving? Like, were they just, you know, stressed out from the physical act of moving? And then she started to look at what they were cleaning the cages with from the old university versus the new university. And she found that the new one, they started spraying it with these quats. And she was like, what is going on with these quats? And so then she started doing all this research and uncovering the fact that they're causing reproductive toxicity and they're in a lot of products. So one of the, I'd probably say poster children is benzalkonium chloride. I see that all the time. Say that six times fast. Yeah. Benzalkonium chloride. I see it all the time. It's in so many products, it, especially during the a uh, couple years ago when we had the pandemic, there was, you know, a yeah. lot of people are sanitizing mm -hmm. and taking extra steps, which is necessarily a bad thing. But there are safer alternatives like ethanol, isopropanol, just very simple alcohol. Rubbing alcohol, water. isopropyl alcohol, right? Exactly. Those were sold out, unfortunately. So people were reaching for this benzalkonium chloride. And I remember going to Whole Foods and just seeing people spray down the carts. It was just like a mist over the cart. And I said, let me see what's in that bottle, sir. And he was one of the workers. And the label was rubbed out. So I asked him to go get the big tank in the back. So he took me to the back and he showed it to me and it was benzalkonium chloride. And I said, oh man, you should not be inhaling that. You shouldn't be spraying that. I mean, this is just so unnecessary. And it's one of the substitutions that, that we see for different uh, antiseptics, I guess, or disinfectants. And what are the health effects again? You, yeah, it's uh, endocrine disrupting. Basically, so, endocrine. Yeah, they're endocrine disrupting. So they disrupt a multitude of different pathways. I mean, there's more than one pathway that they mm -hmm. disrupt, and it's not just estrogen. So these quaternary ammonium compounds, I think, are on the rise as well. And I've seen them in other products too, like um, dryer sheets, some of those anti-wrinkle sprays. I've even seen them in there, and I was shocked. I said, why is this in there? Yeah, and actually, it was years back, like maybe five, six years ago, we went to like some big box store to get tile and um, tile sealant, and they put this stuff in tiles and tile sealant because they figure if you're going to put this in your bathroom, you want no germs. So it's this whole movement of antibacterial, anti-germ warfare that we're being, again, marketed to believe um, and certainly heightened during COVID for a lot of good reasons, but certainly that was a window where manufacturing just skyrocketed of these harmful toxic chemicals, um, you know, and and to your point, the, you know, the safer alternatives that were, you know, were actually all bought out, believe it or not, even like isopropyl alcohol, I would find that in the wound care section. I was like, well, no one's looking there for, for isopropyl rubbing alcohol. So that's where it all was stashed. I was like, yay. But like, you know, most people just, you know, would find that would think that's in the cleaning section, you know? Right. Um, but it was just a pretty much a nightmare. And, and every product that was marketed and still marketed, you know, is, is still a problem. Um, although there are good brands that are sort of safer, cleaner brands. How do you vet your brands when you look for them in your own home? Well, I look for simple ingredients, of course, things that you can understand. Me being a toxicologist and having a background with, you know, chemical names and nomenclature and things like that, then I'm, Definitely not your average consumer in that regard, but some of the tips that I can give if someone is looking to to understand their ingredient labels is look for minimally processed, look for simple ingredients, and shorter is better generally, even though a long ingredients list doesn't necessarily mean that it's immediately harmful. 
You just have to know what you're looking for. Just try to avoid the ones that are just full of synthetic chemical names. These long, long chemical names that you're just like, what is it? No- it's another language. You know, that Briar's commercial growing up was always like where the kids have to pronounce all the names on the on the ingredients list. I thought that that was actually kind of a brilliant marketing you know, um, you know, plan. And I kind of think of the same type of thing when you're applying it to cleaning products or you're applying anything you put on your body, in your body, around your body is kind of look at those ingredients. And even though like what vinegar is acetic acid, right? That doesn't sound so pretty, right? But most chemicals that sound ugly usually are not so great, but keep it simple, short ingredient list and things that you can often recognize, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's pretty straightforward. I mean, there are some innocuous chemicals that have longer names, but you know, mm-hmm. we're not going to get into the weeds there because that's not what they're putting in products, right? And <laughs> they're they're putting in the cleaning products that are harsh enough that can kill bacteria and viruses and things like that. And so, those are usually not pronounceable. <laughs> right. And, and I've even seen the benzalkonium chloride that we were just talking about. I've yeah. seen it in baby wipes. And that to me was just so shocking. I was really, really bothered by that one because I thought, first of all, my opinion, I don't even think you need a baby wipe. That's just my personal take on it. I mean, sometimes there there is a reason for it, but if you're at home, then I, I just washed. Water. I just washed the kids, you know, just water, you know, a towel, whatever, even toilet paper, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, just you don't need those wipes with all those chemicals because those oftentimes will give your kids diaper rash and at least they did for mine you know they would leave a residue on the skin sometimes irritating and then it's just so unnecessary especially with these chemicals in there that are just completely in my opinion just ridiculous yeah no I think it's all great point and it kind of goes back to the idea of like what were humans meant to have on their skin I mean a lot of these microbes that we now know that live on our skin are protective you know it's not all you know staph aureus or something horrible that we think I mean we have staph but that's every human does it's you know so we have to be very kind of understanding of sort of what is too clean you know is there such a thing as too clean and is clean better than living, you know, reasonably with, with, with allowing microbes to live naturally. But um, yeah, there's a big market for it. So tell us more chemicals. Mm, Another one would be, uh, of course, the PFAS chemicals. We won't necessarily see those on ingredient labels, which is pretty insane because there was a study that came out, a group from Notre Dame, they went to major retailers, they bought makeup measured the PFAS in them, and over 90% of them did not list the PFAS on the label. That is, was absolutely mind-boggling to me that you can walk into a store nine times out of 10, you're getting a product with high levels of PFAS, not just a little bit, high levels. Until recently, I don't think people knew much about PFAS. I mean, we saw the movie Dark Waters, maybe if you were interested, and that was sort of a contamination issue, a spillage of, you know, PFAS getting into water in a small town. But I, it really did not make the market up until maybe three, four years ago, two years ago. And I mean, the media. So, you know, A, it's educating people to know it's even exists, what it does, and it's bad for you. And then the next step is to how to know how to keep it out of your body. Like all of these chain events to, to make the product choices, it seems like it's it's such an impossible task. Do you think it's impossible? Well, I don't, I can understand how it might feel impossible, but it's definitely not impossible if we just think about taking it day by day and just looking at the products that you're using every single day, the ones that you use all the time, the the non-negotiables, like the toothpaste, soap, shampoo, body lotion, whatever it is for you. That's where I always recommend people start. Just clean up the ones that you're using all the time. Those should be the cleanest. If it's every now and again, once in a while is going to kill you, probably not. Right. Yeah, and that's a good way to, to to frame it. It's the stuff that's again, it tax it ties in a little bit to the toxicology of the dose and the poison, you know, the more you use, the more you're around it. But it makes common sense because even the low level activity you're avoiding as well, even by getting rid of something you do all the time, like a habit or a daily exposure. So totally makes sense to be thinking it through like that. Um all right, more, more. I, I want more chemicals for you, more products to avoid. You know, this is all usable, practical information. So, you know, if you've got more topics, let's go. Let's let's hear some more chemicals. Well, there are these uh, formaldehyde releasers. 
and there's all I'll get into the next one uh, after that. But formaldehyde releases are are preservatives, and they are so incredibly effective, which is unfortunate because that's what helps manufacturers keep costs low. So they'll put these formaldehyde releasing preservatives in their products, and then you're getting. You know, they might argue, oh, it's low level formaldehyde, but it's still formaldehyde. What is it doing in your product as an intentionally added ingredient is the question. What kind of products? You see it a lot in hair care, a lot of hair care products. And the thing with hair care is a lot of people might think, well, I've rinsed it off. It's not that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. But you actually have a considerable amount of chemical absorption in the scalp simply because of how many hair follicles and how much vascularization there is there, how much blood flow you get to the scalp. So it isn't necessarily something that I would ignore. Shampoo is something that I have absolutely cleaned up and especially for the children. Sometimes my kids like to play with the shampoo. They want to keep it on their head and, you know, make their hair into like a, you know, funny mess or something like that. And so I make sure that the shampoo that you're putting on your kids is, is, is safe. Yeah, that's and formaldehyde also is in wrinkle wrinkle free sheets and stuff like that. That's usually what makes them wrinkle free. So, formaldehyde is used for so many things to preserve it, to keep it in the same shape, in the same you know compounds, staying the same. Like it's it's like the same usability, but in different products that we need or, or we think we need it in. You know, who needs wrinkle free sheets? Come on now, right? Right, right. It's these convenience <laughs> products, these these things that we didn't know we needed. And then right. people get hooked on them and then it just builds from there. And then we start getting, what is it, like the nonstick cookware, the, I mean, I the list goes on and on. Just the wrinkle-free, the stain guard, you know, that kind of stuff. Do you ever sit there and watch TV and see a product come on and you're just sitting there like, I wish there was someone else here to have a drink with and look at this being marketed to the public? Like, yes, I, I often I just find myself, one. you did, yeah? Well, I'm just, what was it? Because there's so many, cr- there was one for a cat's where if your cat's fighting with other cats and biting its nails and, you know, rolling around, then you really need this fragrance, in, in, in this actually plug-in fragrance for your cat's behavior. And the behavior they were describing, and I have a cat, is normal cat behavior. Like, it was just the most absurd thing I'd ever heard on a commercial, that we needed something in the air to be plugged in for the cat to behave better. What is this, like a school child? I, I just couldn't understand it. What was yours? really odd. So I saw a commercial. It was for scent beads. And it was, um, what was it? Less fragrance. No no pungent odors or what was it? No strong fragrance scent beads, but they're still really long lasting. And I thought, how make this make sense? Why does anyone need this? If you're using a product for scent, why are you making it so like low level? I don't understand what this means. Then I thought, okay, immediately... Phthalates came to mind. If it's long lasting, that's a phthalate sort of effect, right? That's a phthalate effect because they help the fragrances to linger. And so if they're using less fragrances, then they're using more phthalates to help it last longer. It just was complete insanity to me when I saw that. Yeah, it was speaking of phthalates, and I think I mentioned to you this on emails, like, you know, my my kids have, or at least one of my kids has a fat, well, no, two of them now, actually, with uh, cologne. And, you know, it's a battle. You know, I don't know how old your kids are, but, like, you pick your battles and, you know, like, okay, a little cologne. I'm not going to fight everything because there might be bigger things I have to fight down the line. Um, But it was interesting because for my kid's birthday, we decided to buy sort of non-toxic fragrance, you know, for him and me to to smell. And we had this sort of, like, smelling party with this kind of trying out these non-toxic fragrances. And sure enough, they smelled really good. The thing that was so interesting is that they didn't really last as long as I would hope, right? You know, like I'm used to the junk. I grew up on the opium and the eternity and the, you know, I I, I don't know. There's so many, um, you know, um, you know, fragrances that I can even pick up and remember from childhood. But for some reason, I was just a little disappointed when they move into this area, like all the new products that are better, they somehow are not perfect yet from what our expectations are. So you have to spray more to kind of get that smell to last longer, even though it's safe. I love that, but you know. But that's what makes it safe is that they've taken away that long lasting effect. So it's, it's, you got to pick and choose your battles, right? It's like, do you want the scent? Exactly. You know, I've had, I've had, well, I worked in the fragrance industry and I would go to Europe. They have manufacturing sites there and they would sell bottles of these name brand fragrances that they were manufacturing for these big brands. 
and they would sell them for, I think it was about, probably about $10 US dollars for a bottle, a large bottle. And so I would, yeah, I would take, you know, requests from my, com- from my coworkers back in Ohio, like, oh, you're going to Europe? Okay, I want this perfume. And, you know, people would line up. And it was, it's such a, a strong connection that, that, that people have to fragrances. But as yeah. soon as I stepped foot into those manufacturing sites, it was, you know, overbearing. The, the odor is overwhelming. I mean, it's, yeah. it's the site of manufacturing. It's like they have vats, you know, and that they're making all of these products there. And it was, and they were, they got complaints from n- nearby neighborhoods from the smells. Really? Yeah. And now I think in uh, California, actually, I remember, remember you used to get out magazines, <clears throat> excuse me, where you open them up and they would smell like perfume. Yeah. And you can no longer do that in the U.S. because it's such, it's considered actually under the American Disabilities Act, I believe out of California was the first on that, um, you know, that you can't really spray even in the workplace perfume. You can actually go after people uh, with, with odors. Really? So, yeah, it's it's interesting. I have to dive or dive deeper into that, but I did see that, and it's it, it does remind me of some of these magazines that no longer have this waft of smell when you open it. You're not you don't smell that anymore, um, and I think it's because people do have reactions, and that was a problem. So, but how does Europe do it better than the U.S.? I mean, since you're on that, you went to your you know, give us a little idea in general about how the U.S. really kind of fails in comparison to Europe when it comes to some of these chemicals that that they've taken out that we don't bother. We don't even care. Yeah, Europe is much more conservative with their chemical policy. So they they do require that manufacturers provide safety data depending on how much of that chemical is planned to be sold. So based on the volume. So if it's something that's really high volume, a lot of that chemical will be sold, then more data is required, which is good, which is good. There is a... Uh, consumer safety actually group within the European Union that oversees and they do risk assessments and hazard assessments of these chemicals. And they'll look at them in consumer products and say, is this safe? Does it make sense based on the data? What data are missing? If there are missing data, then they put it on the restricted list until it can be cleared. So it's the guilty until proven innocent framework. And that's why they're so successful over there. And I think it's also a cultural thing is the, the, the people of Europe, they demand this of their products, right? They expect it. And that's something that we in the U.S. should do as well. We don't have that suit. culture. We don't no. We don't really have that culture, it seems, right. right? Right. It's much more of a, you know, consumer demand and expectation that they have. Whereas people come here and things are, they're shocked at how lax things are here. And there's even reformulations, like there's formulations of companies that make one exact product very different in Europe than they would be allowed. They can't, you know, they, they, they send the junkier version to the United States and they have a cleaned up version of almost the same product. Is that correct? Yes, that is true. It's true for foods and it's also true for beauty and personal care products and also cleaning products, just products across the board, consumer goods. There's so much more stringent um, requirements before something hits the market over there. And so in that way, it's challenging for new innovations to happen, but then it's good for, for the human and environmental health aspect. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's a remarkable situation and system. And, you know, the question is, is it going to change? I mean, you and I, you know, wouldn't be having this conversation if there wasn't a movement towards, you know, thinking about this and making sure that there are products that that are available. I mean, there's more choices now than you and I would say maybe 10 years ago or five to 10 years ago. Um, And then there's the passing of a new law in 2022. It was called MOCRA Modernization of Cosmetics Regulation Act, uh, which was actually, you can mention, the the FDA's biggest shift um, when it came to the Federal Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act from 1938. So nothing since 1938 until this kind of MOCRA movement in 2022. Is it going to shift anything? Tell us what that kind of entails. And if you think it's going to have that much of an impact, has it had an impact? It's already 2024. Well, they're, they're basically requiring manufacturers to have better documentation and they have to register their facilities and they have to have a, an adverse 
um, events reporting system, and they also have to provide substantiation for their safety. However, there is a caveat there. So in terms of whether or not it's that effective, my opinion is no, there, it, there's so much still left untouched when it comes to the safety aspect. So it is requiring that manufacturers and companies have more documentation. They follow more um, GMP manufacturing guidelines. GMP but, being? Um, good manufacturing practice. So yeah. just making sure that their facilities are, you know, kept clean, that they're up to code and things like that. But that's just more on the bacterial and microbial safety aspect of it, not the human uh, health effects of the ingredients that are actually going in the products. So they say that the manufacturers have to have adequate evidence of safety, but no one's actually checking on it. So right. how does anyone know if it's adequate or not? There is no pre-market approval process. There is in Europe. There is somewhat in Europe. There is a review that has to happen. Not here. In the yeah. U.S., compared to Europe, there are 1,328 chemicals on the restricted or prohibited list. In the U.S., there are 11, which is ridiculous, completely ridiculous. And then, I mean, it's no wonder that people have so much more incidents of you know, health issues over here because of the products that were being sold just in all areas, the food, the beauty, the personal care, the cleaning, all of it. It's just complete garbage in some cases, yeah. especially for low income people, they're hit the hardest and it, it shouldn't be this way. And, um, and I think a lot of people were really hopeful that the Mokro would do something, but it's, it's not. <laughs> It's yeah, not it was doing anything. And, and you know, you wonderful description of sort of the the basics of Mokra because I was reviewing it today. And one of the things I noticed is that they had a, com a caveat in there about asbestos and talc products. Like, where did that come from? Oh, I don't know. Just a major million dollar lawsuit. I don't think it was billion, but million for Johnson and Johnson's talc, right? So I see that something in the way of a legal problem for Johnson & Johnson made its way into Mokra because now that was one of the issues with the talc of Johnson Johnson's baby powder that was taken off the market was that there was asbestos mixed in with where they sourced the talc. So I thought, hmm, that's interesting how we really do need more legal cases that are big like Roundup you know, with glyphosate to, to kind of move the market because that's going to be out of residential homes in 2025. So, you know, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I just think it's so tragic, though, that it has yeah. to come to the point where children and people are being harmed generational generations after they were exposed. There's there's a lot that happens, epigenetic changes and things like that, that uh, these toxic insults can translate into issues in generations in the future. That's something that we found in the lab, too. And that really woke me up. I said, okay. We have to really think hard about what we're what we're doing here because this is this is devastating. I mean, not just oh, you know, the kid is a little bit, you know, unhealthy. No, like full on infertility and even cancer in yeah. in the grandchildren. Yeah, because the because the genes are changing even if you don't notice them. We're we're slowly having some of the genetic or the proteins on top of genes morph and change and or methylate or what have, you know, and really make this impact that's ha affecting our fetal germ cells, like our ovaries with the eggs and our, um, you know, the sperm precursor cells and structures. So we have these changes that are actually going on and carried out through successive generations. So it's not even just hard enough to change out your tea and your coffee and all the stuff for us right now in this moment. We have to kind of put our heads on and think like what we do actually might matter if we choose to have kids and if we have offspring. And that's a pretty big thing to wrap our heads around, you know? Yeah, especially when most people are just trying to live their lives, you know? Right. And then it's like, oh, I've got to think about all of this now. Man, like, this was not what I signed up for. <laughs> you know, it's not something you expect. Right. And that's Which, not what we deserve. <laughs> right. It's not what we deserve. And it can get your, your Irish up or whatever ish up you want, but it, it does make me angry. And I think that's also what made you angry and, and actually transitioning into how this kind of passion is now um, your life's work. I mean, you know, tell us a little bit about what you're doing to actually make this burden not so heavy for every individual and parents and consumers. What are you doing? What's your work now? What do you, what are you passionate about now? Yeah, I just really want to share the 
what people, what's lurking under our noses that people might not know about. And just helping people to, to open their eyes and just see like, hey, a lot of these symptoms that you're experiencing and health challenges are not normal and you shouldn't accept them and you can change them just by simply paying attention to what you're consuming and what you're being exposed to. It's not, it's not meant to be this huge, um, what is it, like burden on you. Just make these simple swaps now, make them part of your daily routine and you're, you'll be good. You'll be good to go. That's really the goal is just to really help simplify it for people because there's so much out there. And every single day, there's another chemical that comes up every single day. There's another product that is having these contamination issues. So if you can just make these simple swaps as soon as you can, there are some very basic ones. And it's not like it. I almost like to think of it as like a, the pyramid. You know how they have like that food pyramid? Yeah. There's a pyramid of things that, that are basic necessities that all people, in my opinion, should have. Clean water, clean air, clean food, and clean products. That's, that's the baseline. Everything else on top of that, I think, is a bonus. So I yeah. think really taking it stepwise and looking at it very simply. That's really what I want to help people with is just is I'll do the heavy lifting. I will do the research and tell you if this is <laughs> going to be a big concern if this is something that you should switch right. out and then finding the safer alternatives. So educating the public on the problems, but always bringing the solutions because we have enough fear mongering. We have enough people just getting on their soapbox, but we need real solutions. We need real actionable solutions that people can do right now. And that's really my life's work. And I'm extremely passionate about helping people to read ingredient labels because that's the one thing that I get questions all the time. What do you think of this product? What do you think of that product? Well, if you read the ingredient label, you'll know, is it good or not? And that's, yeah. I, I really want to just teach people very simple toxicological risk assessment framework. <laughs> I created this like roadmap. It's like a series of questions. It's really just a decision tree and it's to help guide people. And so that people can start thinking this way on a daily basis. It's fantastic. Where can people find you and follow you and kind of learn more about the work you do? Oh, I'm on Instagram at Dr. Yvonne Burkar. I'm also active on YouTube. I love making YouTube videos that go really deep into one topic at a time. There's so much complexity out there, but I'd like to simplify it and just really share all of the solutions. And of course, I have a website as well that you can find um, my recommendations. So DrYvonneBurkart.com. Fantastic. I'm so happy that you were on this program. I, I've been following you and, and kind of keeping an eye on all the stuff you're doing. And I think it's fantastic. And, and you also do talk about brands that I don't, I don't do that, but that's a choice that I made for the work I do. But I love that I can follow people and, and really understand what, what their reasoning is behind even certain brand choices. So that's, that's actually a really good resource for me as well. Um, thank you so much for being on my program and for sharing your knowledge. It is such a pleasure. Um, and I really hope that our paths cross again in the future. It's been fun. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. I, it's been an honor. Thank you so much for this opportunity. My pleasure. Thank you.